Hi, welcome back to Central Line. I'm your host, Katie Berlin, and I am here with one of the co-chairs of the very first AHA um, Allergic Disease Management of Allergic Disease Guidelines, um, Dr. Julia Miller. Welcome Hi. to Central Line, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, Julia and I are connected by a thin thread in that we both went to Cornell and actually overlapped by a very little bit. And um, I also learned derm from your dad, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a small world. And uh, this apple tried to fall far from the tree, but I just <laughs> yeah, that's, kept, just, mm, nope. no, kept coming back, <laughs> kept coming back to the tree. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You were, um, you were not going to be a vet at first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Back in the day, I actually wanted to be an opera singer. So I went to school for opera. Um, and then as I was kind of figuring out whether I like singing for a career or not, I decided I didn't like singing for a career and I went back to the vet school route. Yeah. Amazing. Well, vet school is my, was my second um, try to at a career. I was an art history major in college. So, um, <laughs> and then I was like, nope, got to go back to the childhood yeah. dream. So I love that. Yeah. I feel like the arts and derm or the arts and veterinary medicine really seem to go hand in hand for lots of people. That's kind of a common they thread. It's so true. You know, I think one of the practices I worked at, I think four of the veterinarians there were like some kind of liberal arts major, like philosophy or art, like studio art or, you know, and then me, it was just, it was cool. Um, and I feel like, you know, we are putting so much more emphasis on communication now that having good communication skills as we get in other fields um, is actually super helpful and relevant. So anyway, totally off track. Um <laughs> I, I, derm was like a breath of fresh air. I mean, not always literally because sometimes it smelled really bad, but <laughs> yes. it was a breath of fresh air um, after like a long stretch of like, you know, 14 hour days in the clinic for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember sitting in the pod and then um, this dog goes by and someone's like, oh, this dog needs anal glands done or whatever. And Danny Scott, God love him, leaped up off of his stool and expressed mm -hmm. that dog's anal glands with his bare hand in the middle of the room. I mean, yeah. I just, it scarred me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that was like 2008. And it's like it burned into my brain. Yeah. <laughs> you are anyway. not the only vet student that has that story. I've heard that story a yep. couple times. So yep, I, yep. part of me thinks it was kind of like a, like a little party trick he did. Uh, yep, just to, yeah, I have zero yeah. doubt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Julie, would you give us a little bit of an intro to yourself besides, um, you know, what that you can sing really well yeah. and um, what it is you're passionate about now? Yeah. So um, obviously love singing, did that for a long time, but I also grew up a horse girl. Uh, I've ridden since I was a little kid. So um, when I did go to vet school, I actually went to farrier school right before vet school because I wanted to be an equine podiatrist. That was my initial goal. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to let you know that I'm the poster child for changing your career can be very good <laughs> for you. And and you should be open and flexible to how your interests may change. Um, Hallelujah. So, so I, I went to, I was equine at Cornell, equine track. And then after Cornell, I did a large animal rotating internship at the University of Georgia. So after my internship, I didn't want to pursue specialty work because I, I was just kind of burned out from doing the internship. So I wanted to go into general practice also because I really saw the value during my internship being a specialist that people referred to. I saw the value in having a really solid general practitioner who knew what they were doing, knew how to work up cases and then, you know, could refer appropriately. So I went into general practice after my internship and I did mixed animal practice which was a surprise to me. Uh, I was absolutely one of the first people in vet school that, you know, when I finished my small animal medicine rotation, I was like, done, never doing that again, cat diabetes, see you later. Um, and then I became a mixed animal <laughs> practitioner and promptly ate all of those words and um, definitely <laughs> treated a lot of cat diabetes throughout the years. So um, I really enjoyed the large animal aspect of practice uh, tremendously. But I found myself gravitating towards the small animal side of things more than I thought I would have. And I gravitated towards dermatology more than I thought I would have. Um, I also really enjoyed surgery. So as I moved forward in practice, 
I sort of started to develop a love for specialization again. And I decided, did I want to do more surgery or more dermatology? Um, and as it turned out, derm one. So I ended up coming back to Cornell and doing a derm residency. And then I stayed on at Cornell um, after my residency as faculty for a couple of years, which was wonderful. I had a great experience teaching vet students. Um, but now I'm in private practice in Kentucky working with Animal Dermatology Clinic in Louisville. And I love it. I love derm. Give me the grossest stuff, the smelliest things, the chronic diseases that you can't cure. I'm all about it. <laughs> I love it. And um, thank goodness for you, because some of us don't <laughs> love all of that. <laughs> yes. So um, <laughs> um, what about in your free time now? Like you obviously have tried a lot of different aspects of vet med and have found mm-hmm. your your place, um, at least for now. <laughs> we yeah, won't, true. we won't say forever. Um, mm-hmm. but do you have a third space, you know, where you can just be Julia and you don't have to be a specialist yeah. or like doctor or anything? Yeah. Uh, weirdly enough, it's at karaoke. Uh, I adore karaoke. It's so fun. I love going there. Uh, there's actually a, a real dive bar here called Mr. Jeans. And, um, I go there on Thursday nights and have a blast just doing karaoke and hanging out with strangers, making friends. I mean, the beautiful thing about living in the South or in Kentucky is that, you know, you never meet a stranger here. So I I enjoy doing that. And it gives me a little break from, you know, being Dr. Miller. Oh, love it. Well, um, I don't, are, do you know Alyssa Mages? Because she is a karaoke yeah. fan. And uh, so, you know, some vet conference, I have a feeling there's going to be a karaoke night with you there. Heck yeah. Sign Feel me up. Coming. Yeah. Sign me up. Okay. Yeah. Alyssa, if you're listening, you got a victim. Um, <laughs> so, okay, back to the guidelines. Um, so this is the first time, and I can't hardly believe it, but this is the first time that AHA has published a guideline uh, guidelines for the management of allergic disease in dogs and cats. And mm-hmm. I think that's really freaking cool. Um, and I'm really excited to see how the guidelines are received. We're recording this in early October, but they'll be out by the time this episode airs, which is um, going to come out. Uh, they're going to come out with the uh, next issue of Jaha. So um, mm-hmm. end of this month, October 31st. And um you know, it's a massive topic, like massive. What was it like co-chairing that task force? It was such a unique experience for me. I have never been a part of anything consensus related. Um, And it was, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very um, rewarding to work with a group of not just specialists. I really liked that we also had general practitioner, people who are teaching spectrum of care at the university setting. So teaching students actively, um, technicians involved as well. I really enjoyed the, the sort of breadth of knowledge that was brought into the group. And I found it fascinating, you know, Derm is, I always say dermatology is the gray area. There's not one way to fix every case, which is why I love it and many people hate it, right? You know, or find it frustrating. I guess, you know, many people are frustrated by it. Yes. And the truth is we can't, and I wish we could, but man, we can't. But what what I loved about the consensus was even though there were individual differences, the the basis was all the same. You know, we really were able to come together on a lot of things and work through the minute details um, and come to a consensus, honestly, fairly easily, considering how difficult I thought it could be. I thought we did a pretty good job coming to a consensus. So I really enjoyed working with everybody and seeing what their different lived experiences were and how we could bring that to a consensus to move forward for general practitioners, um, technicians, things of that nature. Um, it, it was a uh, very rewarding experience for me. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, and I know the AHA team is really excited for these guidelines, too. Like the the veterinarians um, especially like have been waiting for something like this to come along. And so it was really important to Dr. Taylor, um, Dr. Ingrid Taylor, who's our guidelines director, and Dr. Vogelsang, our chief medical officer. Like they're both just really stoked for this release. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of resources out there for management of allergic disease. Um, and it seems like new ones are popping up all the time. What makes the guidelines different from what's available already? Yeah, I, there's a lot of excellent resources out there. And as someone who had to take derm boards in the last 10 years, I've probably read every single one of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But what I can tell you about these guidelines and this consensus is that it really is geared towards the general practitioner, 
the veterinary technician too, um, as well as even vet students. So what I love about our guidelines is that they are concise they're digestible. They give you bullet points and flow charts, charts of things to do. So it's all very compact. And we did that on purpose, right? We didn't want it to be overly wordy or, you know, overly, um, I don't want to say research because it definitely is research, but we didn't want it to just be a piece of academic stuff. We want it to be right. very practical and we want it to be very approachable and condensed. And I think that that's the benefit of these guidelines is it's a lovely resource that it's not going to take you three hours to read it. You know, you can sit down, read it, get a good idea how to work through things, and then you can reread it and re-reference it later. You know, you can go back and look at a flow chart and say, hey, I've got a food allergic dog. I don't remember how long I'm supposed to feed this diet, let me turn to this page and go through the flow chart that's there and remind myself very quickly, very easily on how to work through that. So I think the approachability of it is, is really one of the benefits of this particular guidelines. So important. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of great resources you have if you need them in a pinch uh, and they're not accessible or they're, it takes you 12 um, mm -hmm. clicks to find it, or you have to find a big textbook and bring it to wherever you are, like you're not going to use them. And so um, that I love that. Um, and I also love what you said about how uh, it's geared towards not just the general practitioner, but their team as well. And to mm -hmm. vet students who are entering the profession feeling like I don't know about people listening. But when I got out of vet school, I knew how to treat the weird stuff. Yeah. Like I could manage the endocrine disaster mm -hmm. in the ICU. And I had no idea how to treat otitis, you know, yeah. like just your run of the mill case of otitis with what was on the shelf at the clinic. And um, so having something that just is sort of like a, a cliff's notes of all of that for when you're deer in the headlights overwhelmed um, is very, very helpful. Um, and having technicians involved is something that I definitely want to talk about. And actually, we could just jump to that right now. Yeah. Because um, so Amanda Friedek, who's a VTS in dermatology, um, was on the task force as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like that's a unicorn thing to find a VTS in dermatology. <laughs> um, yeah. And she just wrote an actually a great article on um, technician utilization in derm cases for the October issue of trends. It's a great piece. Um, and I'm interested to hear, um, you know, about some of her input. Like, did you find that having a technician on the task force changed how you saw some of the things that you would otherwise have wanted to say or um, changed your point of view in any way? Yeah, it was so lovely having her there because, I mean, I always like to see things from another side and seeing things from the technician side to a doctor, I think is such an important perspective to have, whether you're a specialist, a general practitioner in industry, I, I don't think it matters. Technicians are just their opinion and their, the way they see things is so invaluable. So yeah. having her being able to, to chime in for us was great. Uh, she definitely had some direct influence on what we said and how we can utilize technicians and, you know, where we should put that in. And I think the value of the technician in a dermatology workup is, incredible. Uh, we can't overstate their value, truthfully, because the way I look at it, they are an integral part of just about every piece of our workup. So right from the moment that pet enters the room in dermatology, history taking is critical. It's, it's a big part of what we need, a big part of what we do. That's not necessarily true. If you're, if you got a limping dog, you know, it's my pit bull who rector, rector cruciate, who really cares how she did it, who really knows how she did it. Um, but in dermatology, we care, you know, when did the itch start? What is the level of the itch? What treatments have you used? The history taking is a huge part of the derm workup. And by the way, the consensus guidelines, we have that detailed, like down to the question for you. So what an awesome resource for your technicians, assistants, vet students yes. to read, you know, to get an idea for what you should be asking. But right off the bat, your technician is your first line of defense. You know, they're the ones that you can train to get that excellent history. And that's going to set you in the correct direction on the case. Second piece we talk about a lot in the um, consensus is cytology. You know, dermatologists say it like a broken record. I'm ready to get it tattooed on my forehead. You know, did you do cytology is I think what is going to be <laughs> tattooed on my forehead at some point. Um <laughs> And you I'm might have to it. go for the bangs <laughs> yeah. just for some social situation. <laughs> bangs or a beanie. Yeah. yeah. That seems reasonable to me. I love it. Maybe I'll do like my forearm, something like that. You yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but technicians are another gigantic part of, of making cytology feasible, you know, for years. You talked about otitis externa. I mean, when I worked at my practice, my general practice in North Carolina, I taught all of my technicians to how to sample the ears, how to interpret the ear sample. I didn't even sit at that microscope when it came to ear stuff. So and if you have a savvy technician, you can also teach them how to take your skin cytologies for you. So that by the time you're walking in the room, you've already got all that behind you and your technician can really help you be more efficient, but also more accurate, which I love. Um, and then, you know, once you make your, your diagnostics, you figure everything out you're doing, you're going to talk with the client. It's going to go half over their head, their deer in the headlights, right? We just talked about a chronic long-term disease that we're not going to cure. And then you leave the room. But then you got to remember that, that again, that line of defense you have is your technician and they can go back in. They're the ones who can reiterate everything. Say, did you understand what she said? Do we, let me show you how to put the ear medication in. Let me show you how to use the mousse. Here's your Apoquel. This is twice a day, you know, that sort of a thing. So utilizing technicians for derm cases, I think is just so incredibly important. And we have a lot of that in the guidelines as to where to use them, because I think that it's very important that we recognize their value. And then we also give them things to do that aren't just holding a dog and squeezing a butt gland. You know, yes. I, I think that there's a lot of value and our technicians are very trainable, very teachable and can do a lot for us in these cases. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I don't know what I would have done in my last practice. Um, we had a lot of credential technicians who read all the cytologies and um, in many cases took the samples, um, skin scrapings and whatnot. And it was, um, I mean, I, we wouldn't have gotten through the day otherwise. Um, I'm sure I drove them all crazy, you know, like doing the thing where you're like hanging around like in the, in the vicinity of the microscope. And then are you sure? And looking in the microscope and they were always sure, you know, they're, they were great and knew what they were doing. And it made me feel so much more confident, um, having a, an extra set of skilled hands there, um, hands and eyes, um, to, to make sure that I wasn't missing stuff in my derm cases. Um, and, I one of the things that I love about hearing you talk about working with Amanda on the task force is that that process really the task force process and the creation of these guidelines really sets the is a model for how we should be working with technicians in practice, um, which is they're members of the team, they're educated, they have their own experience and their own opinions about how we should be doing things and we should listen. Um, there's no reason why veterinarians should think they have all the answers when the technicians are like right there on the floor with them. And in many cases, for a lot longer, <laughs> while we're typing up charts. So um, I, I love that so much. So um, thank you for weighing in on that. Do you want to give any shout outs to any particular technicians um, that you've worked with or work with now? I've had, I have been blessed with so many incredible technicians in my life. Like I could get teary talking about all the, the ways I've been shaped as a veterinarian mm -hmm. by the people that I've worked with, because it's been, they've truly been incredible. Um, my derm techs at Cornell, Joby and Tara that were, went through my residence with, residency with me, man, love them to death. And then there is actually a technician that my first job in North Carolina, her name was Miss Niece. And, you know, she's kind of one of the classic been around the block technicians, but she was just so wonderful to me. She was the kind of person that would say, Dr. Julia, stand up, you know, when I was in surgery and I was bending over and she'd look out <laughs> through my back. She, she'd make sure that, you know, she shared her crackers with me at lunchtime if I wasn't eating. You know, she would, if I was in surgery with just a blank look on my face, she'd say, calm down, take a breath, you got this. And she'd remind me that I really did know what I was doing. And I, I will never forget her and, and the kind of value and experience she gave to things. So so shout out to Denise. You're an incredible human being. Love it. Um, okay. So let's talk about something else that you mentioned um, briefly before, which was spectrum of care. You said that you mm -hmm. were working with people who were actually teaching and talking about spectrum of care in dermatology cases. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that, what that means and why you think yeah. it's so important? Yeah, I think spectrum of care is something we're talking a lot more about in veterinary medicine and also talking more about teaching it to the vet students, because mm -hmm. the way I look at life, you know, there there's the gold standard, the ivory tower, the best of the best. And then there's a lot of stuff beneath that that's still really good veterinary medicine and really good care towards a patient. And I know that firsthand when I practiced in general practice, I was in rural North Carolina for my first job and 
gold standard, best of the best just was not economically, emotionally, physically feasible for many of my clients. And I think the important thing to do is that we look at the whole case and how can we provide the best medicine um, with everything that we're given. So to me, spectrum of care means that there's more than one way you know, to fry an egg. There's a lot of different ways to approach a case. And we need to look at what people can do, what people can afford, and how to help our patients in the best way possible. So we thought about that a lot in these guidelines. You know, Of course, I might say every single case needs these 10 things every single time, but you can absolutely still treat cases and work cases up without doing every single thing every single time. So we tried to kind of take into consideration um, what you can do, how to work with what you have effectively and still, and still get really good care for our patients. That is so refreshing to hear. I know a lot of people, um, you know, will have mixed opinions about that because I think a lot of people think of the AHA guidelines as best medicine or gold standard or whatever those phrases mean. But I think over the last you know, at least the last couple of years when I've been at AHA, I've seen the definition of best medicine change dramatically from, you know, the ivory tower, like this is what you learn in in school in the textbooks and you get tested on kind of thing to um, best medicine is what's best for that pet and that client in that room at that moment. And that sometimes does not look, often does not look like the textbook um, solution. And, you know, What's worse, like doing something less than quote unquote gold standard or uh, sending that pet home without care? So um, do you feel like spectrum of care um, approaches will help to Im improve compliance with clients and trust in the veterinary team? Yeah, I think I really do think they will. And I, I think especially in dermatology, it can get really expensive really fast, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's not all about money. It never is all about money, but that's a very real thing, you know. So, for example, steroids for a chronically allergic dog. You know, I've had clients now currently as a specialist, I've had clients that that's just all they can afford. And I think taking the stigma off of things and saying, you know, hey, if this is what you can do for your pet to be comfortable, I'm working with you. I'm with you to try to help your dog. If you can't afford this very expensive skin culture, guess what's cheap? Bleach. Bleach is cheap. This topical mousse, this shampoo that we have is pretty cheap. Uh, you know, your dog has widespread bacterial infection, but you are never going to do a topical because it's a, you know, a crazy pit bull who doesn't sit still. You can have an oral antibiotic because that's what will work for you and your patient. You know, these are all the things that I think we try to take into consideration with Spectrum of Care. And I'm very happy that the guidelines were able to address some of that and take mm -hmm. a little bit of the, the shame. Let's get rid of the shame. We all yeah. practice vet med. We're all here for the clients and the patients. And I think it's just important that in the end, we try to do what we can do to make the pet feel better and also to make the client feel better and to make the client trust that we're not trying to just sell them Apoquel or sell them, sell them this or sell them mm -hmm. Batril, you know, that we're actually trying to work with them to help their pet feel better. Same thing. I would imagine if a client has um, some kind of disability or limitation mm -hmm. where they can't use the treatment that you ideally would want to, they work two jobs and they're gone from the house, mm -hmm. you know, 16 hours a day, or um, they can't get down on the floor and they have this tiny dog yeah. and no one to help them or whatever. Yes. And those things I think are such an important consideration when you said it, like, it's not all about the money. Um, and in many cases, there are lots of other factors. So um, yeah. I think a lot of people are going to be really excited to see that that was taken into consideration for, for these guidelines. Um, it just feels like a more modern and realistic approach to treating one of the most common things that we see. Um, yeah. And, you know, you bring up communication is everything in Durham cases. And, yeah. and even, even I, Sorry, in the room, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like, it's what, it's what we got to do. I think maybe that's why mm -hmm. I love it. Cause I love to talk. So there's also that. Um, but even in the room I was in today, every single time I say, can you treat your dog's ears? every day? Does that work out for you? Like I have that conversation every single time before I prescribe a medication. And if the client says, no, I can't, then I pivot. Then right. maybe the long acting ear med was not my first choice, but it is the choice I will make today because it's the choice that works for that pet and for that client. So, um, you know, I think Durham is gray land. You do have a lot of areas that you can pivot and make adjustments in all of the specialists that were in the task force 
felt really good about trying to take the shame off of things and not saying it has to be this way. You have to do this. You have to do this every single time that there are other options and other ways to very effectively work up and manage these cases. This AHA podcast is brought to you by Care Credit. Care Credit understands that all veterinary teams are busier than ever. To help patients get the care they need, the Care Credit Health and Pet Care Credit Card allows clients to access a budget friendly financing experience anytime from anywhere on their own smart device. They can learn, see if they pre qualify, apply, and even pay if approved, all on that smart device. With just a tap, they have a friendly, contactless way to pay over time for the services and treatments their pet needs, whether it be a general, referring, or specialty hospital, as long as they accept the Care Credit credit card. What about referral? Because you said these were these are geared towards general practice teams, yeah. um, and general practice, as we all know, we see derm like day in, day out, particularly at certain <laughs> times of the year, um, depending yeah. on where you live. But I mean, that was the bread and butter besides like wellness exams at mm-hmm. my practice in Pennsylvania. Um, and I, one of the things that I struggled with and sometimes struggled with with colleagues was um, when to refer derm cases. Um, because when clients get differing messages from different mm-hmm. doctors in the practice or different team members in the practice, it's sometimes hard to convince them that referral is warranted or is the in the best interest of that pet, even if they have the money, because they're mm-hmm. like, well, so-and-so will just treat it. But, yeah. you know, there's a big difference between throwing cephalexin at the problem over and over mm-hmm. again and actually mm-hmm. getting a diagnosis and trying to figure out what's going to work best for the pet. And, mm-hmm. um, and it's, that is a challenge for me and I'm sure many other people in practices, particularly multi-doctor practices out there. What would you like general practitioners to know about referring derm cases? Yeah. I mean, um, th- now's your chance. <laughs> oh, listen, <laughs> refer to, to give it to me. No, uh, <laughs> I think, I think there's a few things. Referral, I mean, obviously, I want you to refer all the things to me all the time because I love being busy. But at the same time, I recognize that referral is not an option for every patient and every client. So I, the big thing I would say with referral is if you think that you've got a client who might be interested, start the conversation early. Um, and that, and they don't have to refer early, but you can just drop the fact that a dermatologist does exist into the conversation early ish, because I can't tell you how many of my clients come and tell me now I don't, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, but they say, I had no idea you existed. You know, I've been going to my vet for 10 years with this itchy dog and I didn't know a a veterinary dermatologist existed. Now, maybe they'd been told about me a hundred times and they just forgot. Um, but I also do think it's important for us to mention that because also I remember in practice, some clients will surprise you. Clients you would never think would have referred will be like, oh, yeah, I'll go. I'll, yeah, I'll go tomorrow. You know, so so talk about it early. I think bring it up early if there's a case. You know, we could talk about derm referral for weird skin and stuff like that all day long. But I think for the allergic pets, particularly what we're trying to get at with this consensus When you have an allergic pet that you're having some difficulty managing, you know, you're needing more drugs, you're stacking drugs on top of each other, you're using a lot of antibiotics, it really seems to be that repeat offender. Early referral of those patients is truly critical. You know, if you if that gets sent to me six years down the line, sometimes there are skin changes that are irreversible. There's allergic itch that I'll never get under control without high potency steroids at that point in time. So if you have a client that's interested Early referral for the allergic cases is a great idea. Let us get that under control and you can have the dog back for all of the other things that's, that's going to happen. You know, we, we talk about, for example, allergy testing. And that's something that, you know, if you're sending us the 12 year old Labrador for allergy testing, well, it can take a year for immunotherapy to kick in. And, you know, that's a 12 year old lab and that ship has yeah. kind of sailed a little bit. So yeah. younger patients getting them into do- in the door. The the benefit of us, right, here's kind of how I feel about dermatologists and derm referral. We're not that much different than you GPs. In fact, I think GPs are the unsung heroes, some of the smartest people I know. You are more than capable of doing everything I do. Let's be perfectly honest. You are. But what what do I have that you don't? I have time. I have time on my side. I remember what it was like to be in 15 minute appointments and have a C-section and seven Pargo puppies coming in the back. And I've got, how am I going to get this dental and also do those five cat neuters? I remember those days. I don't have that anymore, man. All I do all day is I work <laughs> on skin. 
you know? So <laughs> I have, I have the time, I have the luxury of being able to sit with that client and Derm is so much communication that I can do that. I have specialty trained technicians who also can do that communication for me. Um, and again, it's, it's all I do all day. So I think about mm -hmm. the cute little tricks and the other things that I can do. Um, so send them to me early if you can, because that's going to give the patient and the client the best chance at achieving success, or at least start having the conversation early. I recognize that a lot of clients won't come right away, but if you kind of drop the hints and say a dermatologist does exist, you know, you're, you've been here for bacterial infection four times this summer. Maybe we should start thinking about seeking some extra help. Um, I think that can be really important. And another big thing with, with dermatology that kind of, I, I like to, whenever I lecture, I talk about it is that, you know, many people are not going to do TPLOs if they're not fully trained in how to do a TPLO, right? Because if you're not good at it, the potential consequences are catastrophic. Yeah, they don't they don't think that way about derm cases, right? Because it's right. not catastrophic. But right. the reality is it it kind of is because you get people who don't like their animals anymore because they can't stand the way they smell, they can't stand listening to them lick all night long, you know. So the the pet owner bond gets damaged by chronic mm -hmm. derm. The amount of money they will spend is ungodly, you know, when they when they're visiting and this drug and that drug and this antibiotic and whatnot. So financially, it, it can be very taxing on clients. And then the other thing is. If you're if clients aren't happy with how you're working up their case in a derm sense, they're less likely to bring that pet back to you for other things. So they're more likely to seek another veterinarian for all of that animal's care. So it also kind of loses you business in some sense and, and loses your ability to have that relationship with that pet for the rest of their life. So early referral is important. I encourage people not to think of derm cases as just like, eh, I can tinker. Who really cares? No, you should care. These are serious things, you know, and, and there's a there's a reason we exist. <laughs> so, so send them to us, you know. That is all so helpful. Like, I wish I'd had that early in my career. I wish that I had heard that um, early on because I think I felt very judged sometimes if I referred a pet to mm -hmm. a derm because, um, you know, technically, like you said, I could do it, but it probably would involve um, a lot of calls and mooching of information off of the dermatologist, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. God love you. You guys are all so <laughs> helpful and kind and like willing to talk. And, um, you know, I shout out to Long Green Veterinary Dermatology in Pennsylvania <laughs> or Maryland. Maryland, Pennsylvania, because they were absolutely like fantastic with all of my million questions for clients that wouldn't refer. But I'm just thinking of like the average English bulldog. I feel Ooh. like you should just refer them when they're like 14 weeks old, sometimes yeah. earlier, because there's going to be you, you don't have to wonder if you mm -hmm. just wonder when, and mm -hmm. you know, when it comes, it's not going to be easy. And you yeah. know that no matter what you say, the client is not going to have seen all of it coming. And like, some relationships just should exist from an early age. Mm -hmm. But not having come up with that mindset through the, my years in practice, um, it was hard to justify that to myself and to people around me, I think, um, much less to clients, especially if they'd been seeing like, you know, my boss who mm -hmm. barely referred a derm case ever. It mm -hmm. just wasn't something mm -hmm. that they did. So um, I think that's super helpful to keep in mind. And also, I love what you said about how you have time and you have mm -hmm. trained team members and you have all the handouts ready and mm -hmm. you have all the discharge instructions already made up. And yeah. those are just things that not only do we not have to do, but then we can learn from because we'll see those yeah. records and can actually just like absorb that knowledge when we're reading those discharge statements. Um, I've learned so much from specialists just from what they've done, you know, years later, thinking about what they did with the patient in mind. So I really appreciate that perspective. And, and you know, I, I there's definitely clients that that won't refer, and I yes. totally understand that. And the other thing is, there are practitioners out there that love dermatology, and I love that. You know, yeah. like I said, you're pretty dang capable of doing most of what I do. But you know, having taught the curriculum at a vet school, and and having talked to a lot of vet students from different vet schools about how much derm they get, there's no way you can get enough of it in school, right? There's just mm -hmm. no way. There's not enough hours in the day for us to teach you all the dermatology we need to teach you, considering how much you're going to see when you're out in practice. So, you know, if you happen to be one of those practitioners, 
that's just like, I adore Derm. I'm pumped about it. I want to do more and be better. Go to CEs. You know, there's so many mm-hmm. Derm lectures at conferences. Um, read up in the literature. Go to the CE. You can absolutely improve your Derm practice and be incredible at what you do, too, by continuing your own education as well. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Last question that I have for you is, okay, these guidelines are packed. They're so meaty. Um, just absolutely packed with information. Um, like you said, it's digestible. But mm-hmm. if you had one or let's say up to three, <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> yeah. there's a lot yeah. in there, um, there is, pearl, yeah. Of, yeah. pearl of wisdom from them yeah. that you're like, okay, if you take one thing away from these guidelines, yeah. I want it to be this, what would it be? I, that, I was thinking about that. Um, and that is such a, it is very hard to have one pearl of wisdom. I think yeah. that there's a couple mantras in Derm that I even think that these guidelines really bring up. And one of those is if at first you don't succeed, you miss something, do more diagnostics. So mm. we talk a lot in these guidelines about, you know, if you're using Cytopoint for itch control and it's going great, and then all of a sudden it's not going great. The dog is is itching all over the place. Did you make see if there's a bacterial infection with your cytology? Is there now malesthesia dermatitis? Does the dog have scabies or fleas because they stopped their flea preventative? So if something that worked is stopped working, do more diagnostics. Just don't switch that dog to Apoquel and say, oh, I guess Cytopoint isn't working anymore. We need to move it. You know, make sure that you use all of the of the things you have at your disposal to try to get to the bottom of why things change. So if at first you don't succeed, do more diagnostics. You miss something, you know, something's going on there. Um, and another thing I think that's really important that we talk a lot about in the guidelines is as frustrating, as frustrating as it is, there is no one size fits all that works for every patient. So it is really important to have lots of communication with your client about how they're doing things, how successful is the thing? Do we need to pivot that kind of thing? And if one drug doesn't work, try another drug. Don't just keep trying the same drug over and over again and expect different results, right? You may need to pivot. We may need to change because all of these patients are um, very unique in the way they present and all of them are very unique in the way they respond to our treatments. And then I think last but not least for me, man, history taking matters so much. We have a whole, both of these things have whole big sections about history taking for a reason, you know, in dermatology, it really does matter because, you know, when you're talking about environmental allergy versus food allergy, it's all in the history. It's not in your physical. Yeah. They, they look the same. They're identical dogs. It's all in yeah. the history taking. So utilize your technicians, train your technicians, please, to be, you know, to ask more than just vomiting, diarrhea, you know, how you doing at home. Make sure you're getting that thorough history because that really does make is a huge part of your workup. I mean, that that's a mic drop right there. And the guidelines will help everyone watching and listening to do, um, a, I won't say a better job, because I know a lot of people are doing a really fantastic job already of working up these, these allergy cases, but we could all use a little extra help just given the sheer number that we see and how frustrated people get. I mean, that's another mm-hmm. thing that I, I had meant to come back to is what you said about how some people by the time they see you don't even like the pet anymore. And like, yeah. I yeah. have seen that so often mm-hmm. and it's so sad and I don't blame them at all. Like, mm-hmm. you know, your average bulldog is gross <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's not their fault, but like they smell weird and there's discharge everywhere and like the wrinkles yeah. and, and they're mm-hmm. licking everything if they can reach it even. And mm-hmm. if they're not licking it, they're scooting it. And like, mm-hmm. I just, I don't blame owners at all for being like, oh my God, like, what am I going to do? And like, yeah. I don't want to even have people over to my house because it smells like this dog. Um, and at the same time, you know, they really love those dogs. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, if nothing else, is motivation to try to get these under control sooner. And if not, send them to you. Um, it's not a write-off. It's a, it's a, leveling up of that dog's care to somebody who has a lot, like you said, a lot more time to spend on it. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people, well, well, my dad used to always say germ cases don't die. They just smell like it. Um, (laughs) I think I remember that. (laughs) And I mean, he's correct. He's 100% correct. But, you know, I do think 
I think it is important that we we take our germ cases seriously, you know, and make sure that that we don't approach them. You know, like a lot of people are ready to refer eyeballs because it's like, man, if I mess up, the dog loses an eye. Well, think about that same way for your germ cases. If you mess up, they might they might send the pet to a shelter, you know, and then and then that's lost. So the consequences can be negative if we don't manage our germ cases appropriately. Um, And I think it's important that people kind of take that and think about it, that it's not just about a little print and a little cephalexin, you know, it kind of does go a little bit deeper there. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Julia Miller, thank you so much for joining me on Central Line. Um, It's been a pleasure to have you and always a pleasure to meet a fellow Cornelian. Um, And uh, I'm sure your dad is super proud, like, even though, even if this isn't what you meant to do and you were like, dad, that's never going to happen. Like, I'm sure he's super proud. Um, and, uh, it's really been, um, been great to chat with you. Thank you so much for spending this time. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope everybody reads the guidelines. Um, you got any questions, let me know, but I think they're going to be really helpful. A nice consent thing for you to take a look at, have a, have a drink of coffee in the morning, read the guidelines, you know, make sure you're up to date. Um, but thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Terrific. Thanks again. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. We'll catch you next time on Central Line.